My name is Devin Rohr, and I am the Associate Director here for the U.S. Payments Forum, and we have got a wonderful uh, webinar here for you uh, on electric vehicle technology. Um, we have a fantastic team that's been working behind the scenes that is really excited uh, to bring you this webinar. At this time, we would like to do a polling question. Um, Danielle, are you ready with the polling question? Perfect. So you'll, you're going to see a poll that has popped right up, and we'd like for you to fill out this information. Uh, we'd love to know which industry, stakeholder category best describes your organization. We've got several for you to choose from. So if you could please populate that, those results, that would be great. We've got about 12 seconds left of the poll. All right, it's looking good. Um, it looks like we have got, Danielle, if you could click the button that says share the poll with attendees. Um, looks like we've got 43% is financial payments. Uh, the next up is we've got 42 that did not answer, 42% that didn't answer, but of those of you that did, we've got 44% of financial payments, 15% of technology providers, 3% of fuel, 2% of government agencies, and then we've got a couple of 1%. We've got charging payment networks, vehicle manufacturers, and then retailers. So looking pretty good, our audience. Thank you for doing that. All right, I wanted to share a bit with you um, about our mission here at the U.S. Payments Forum. Um, we are a cross-body organization that focuses on payments, and really what we'd like to do is get everybody together um, from all stakeholders groups. We view everyone here as everybody's got one seat at the table, um, and our steering committee members are is a cross-body organization that um, that votes and talks about all of the education here. They um, really do a fantastic job. Um, we've got our current topics and issues. We, the pandemic has certainly changed a lot about payments and buy now, pay later and contactless. And so we've been really focusing on that um, along with the Petro Transit and Hospitality. Um, we work a lot with EMB 3D Secure and try to work on education tools and best practices for those. Um, we have been focusing a lot beyond EMV and advanced payment topics. And so we focus a bit about mobile payment and tokenization, uh, identity and authentication, um, and digital currencies as well. And recently we had we published a few white papers, um, one regarding eight digit bin and the impacts for that that is actually coming out this month another on global chip supply um, and how that is affecting payments, and then debit routing and EMV 3D secure. So we definitely try to stay current um, with that. All right, we have a lot of different activities and resources with the forum, um, educational programs, communications networking. We work to collaborate on a bunch of different products. So, uh, yes, so our this webinar and Cindy, I think that I'll be turning the time over to you right about now, if you don't mind. Um, yes, um, so Devin, thank you. Thanks um, so much for the opportunity to be here today to host this webinar and share what's next for open payments. A lot has happened in the US over the years and we have leapfrogged future proofing payments with innovation and now reference payments in the same sentence as urban mobility sustainability, connected cars, and electric vehicles. So looking forward to being able to part, be a part of this payment journey. So now let's review the agenda for today's webinar. Today we will be covering an overview on the US EV landscape, current industry market status, and clarify some common interoperability questions with payments. Then NIAX will share details on reader implementation considerations, best practices, as well as any known challenges. GND will provide a high level overview of the ISO 15118 standard and how it works, 
and BP will share benefits of implementing plug and charge technology, as well as pain points for consideration. Lastly, we will review some global payment network considerations for accepting open payments, and then followed by Q&A. So let's get started. There are several industry resources available today, as Devin had mentioned, and as a part of that, in February of 2021, the Secure Technology Alliance produced two industry initiatives. They published a white paper outlining a path to an open payments infrastructure for paying for EV charging using plug and charge technology. And also hosted a webinar similar to this on payment platform innovations for EV charging stations to educate the, the industry on new technologies. Both of these are available for download by visiting the Secure Technology Alliance website. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Oliver Manahan with Infineon Technologies, who will provide the US EV market status update. Oliver? Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Cindy, and, and thanks everybody for attending. I'm gonna try to go through these slides as quickly as I possibly can because uh, a lot of the, uh, <laughs> the real information follows to the uh, presenters behind me. So my goal here is just to sort of set the stage. So if we could move to the uh, next slide, please. So the main um, sort of challenge that I think we face, and, and personally I, I drive an EV and I'm, I'm on my third one now, is when you uh, get to the charging station, it's quite dissimilar from what we've become accustomed to at a, a typical petroleum station, which is you pull up, um, aside from the choice of, of diesel or, um, or gasoline, you, you don't have a lot of choices and, and it's really difficult to actually fit a diesel uh, nozzle with, within a gas um, uh, enclosure for for the car but in terms of paying it's it's you know you insert your card or you tap your card or you tap your device etc and and you kind of know what to expect with charging an electric vehicle particularly if you're leaving sort of your your home area and, and you're getting into a charging network that you may not have encountered before um, th there are a number of sort of variables that the the driver the consumer faces you know many, many of which are illustrated here is is the charging port compatible with my uh, vehicle so there are different ones uh, chatmo ccs tesla um, the question of what do I need to gain access? Uh, some are already uh, open loop payment where you can, you know, tap your Visa, MasterCard, uh, Discover, Amex card and, and carry on with the transaction, but others require um, a FOB that you need to tap. Others require a mobile app that you preload funds onto. Um, and you know at what stage you have to do these some of them are quite complicated in terms of you know you have to tap your fob then you have to do something then you have to do the next step and and it, it can be quite daunting and confusing uh, what we really need to get to is that similar type of experience that consumers have become used to uh, with petroleum uh, some of the other uh, questions, you know, is the payment secure? How do I pay? Is it free? What is the cost? Um, is it a fast charger? So, you know, a number of variables. And, and again, what we really want to do is, is take those uh, multitude of variables and consolidate them down to um, what we've all come to know and like in, in the fairly easy and ubiquitous uh, gas pump experience. So next slide, please. Uh, the, the interesting thing with um, EV charging stations, unlike gas stations, you know, gas is federally regulated, has to be transported, you know, stored within the grounds of um, the, the gas station, et cetera. Whereas, so, so there will be, you know, and are a finite number of, of gas stations, whereas uh, EV charging stations, um, ironically, well, there are not probably as many as there are gas stations today. At least it seems like that sometimes when you're traveling from city to city or state to state, uh, the opportunity exists for the number of uh, EV supply equipment to, to far uh, outnumber what exists in, in gas stations, because essentially you just have to be able to connect to the grid somewhere, um, put up the charging station and you're good to go. In fact, you may not even need a grid if you've got some sort of alternate power like, like solar. So, um, but again, it's that's all nice that, you know, you can put an EV uh, supply equipment anywhere, but what you, um, really want to be able to have is that simplistic and ubiquitous technology for, for access and for payment and, and then uh, deployment paying for the energy supply. We go to the next slide, please. 
And so this is just some statistics um, that we've gathered from a couple of different sources. You know, currently in the US market, there are approximately 2 million electric vehicles, but the expectation is that um, electric vehicles by 2030, so within eight years, will represent 30% uh, of the vehicles driven within the US, and that will be approximately 22 million. And in terms of charging stations, there are about 90,000 um, individual plug-in um, outlets where, where you can charge. And again, depending on you know policies and what sort of incentives governments may provide, uh, that by 2030 is expected to go to 1.3 million locations. And then the third column there is just you know what the government is currently. Um, offering in terms of federal tax credits for EVs, but they're also going to be infrastructure. There's an infrastructure bill for um, electric vehicle charging stations, things like that. Um, if you could tell from my accent, I'm actually Canadian and, and we have very similar. We have a $5,000 federal tax credit for EVs. And we, we just had, I think it was a $900 million um, federal government invest in terms of uh, expanding charging infrastructure. So no, this isn't just a, you know, a US issue. And in fact, many of us probably travel for work and we're getting now to the point where um, you can go to Europe and, and actually rent an electric vehicle. And wouldn't it be nice to have that same sort of easy, you know, plug and pay, pay type of technology that, you know, we, we don't worry about how to get gas if we travel to Germany, France, et cetera. We need that same sort of experience, not just ubiquity in the US market, but ubiquity uh, globally as well. So next slide, please. So this is kind of the, you know, the, the goal, the, the objective of, of what we're looking to accomplish, you know, not through, not just through this webinar, but through white papers and through working, um, you know, through industry partners to experience or to get to that same experience of where we can eliminate uncertainty about the accessibility and availability of EV charging stations, simplify and enhance the charging experience and achieve that consistent charging experience across all networks so not have you know a b and c all be good and ubiquitous but different so we really need that you know standardization ubiquity across all networks if possible next please And this is really just a snapshot. It's by it's by no means um, exhaustive because you know <laughs> I was I was fortunate enough. I just picked up a couple months ago uh, a Hyundai Ionic Five. It's not on this list, so I know that you know Hyundai and Kia have lots of models in the pipeline as well. But if you look at the bottom three, they're they're pure electric vehicle companies. The top six um, have historically been uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, manufacturers, but even if you do like a quick look in the next few years with this group, there will be over 50 new models introduced in the next couple of years. Um, they all expect, you know, obviously those ones that are pure electric are will be 100%, but the big major car manufacturers by either 2025 up to 2030 uh, expect 50% of their uh, new car sales to be electric vehicles. So this isn't it's no longer a question of, of if this will happen, but when it will happen. And perhaps the most interesting column in this entire chart is the fact that the, the major investments that all of these companies are making are on the EV side of their business, not the historic internal combustion side of their business. So it's it's huge multi-billion dollar investments to move to a, you know, a greener, cleaner uh, type of mobility. Next slide, please. And as you can probably tell, um, th this slide, March 2021, the uh, the gas prices were a little bit uh, easier on the pocketbook than they are today. And in fact, I think in Canada, if you did the equivalency test, we're close to $10 Canadian um, per gallon. And, and I know I've been in the U.S. recently. It's in the five and even six dollar range that I've seen. So the um, th there's three sort of categories of charging. And, and the first one is kind of what you'd plug in, you know, at your house without any equipment. Frankly, you can, you know, plug into a wall socket. Um, I would suggest this isn't great for your daily drive, but if you happen to be parked somewhere for days at a time, like if you're, you know, renting a, 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 a vacation place, which I, I do every summer, you know, you can plug in on a slow charger, you get between three and five miles per hour of charge. But if you're charging for four days, then that's enough to get you back home. 
but the typical, you know, home charger will be a level two. And, and if you look, I know mine is sort of seven kilowatts per hour. If you do the, the basic math, if you've got a 70 kilowatt battery, it takes essentially 10 hours to charge, which is perfect for that. You know, you daily commute, you do however many miles you do, and then you just plug in overnight. And by the time um, you wake up in the morning, uh, you've got a fully charged battery. What we're really talking about with this webinar is the DC fast charging, which is direct current. And the charging there tends to be between 50 and 350 uh, kilowatts per hour. So you can get, you know, 60 to 80 miles in, in 20 minutes and, you know, certainly becoming faster, um, both on the, the vehicle infrastructure side and the charging infrastructure side. So that if you're taking those longer road trips, you know, on interstates and things like that, you don't have to stop for three hours and, and you know, get bored of things to do in terms of uh, eating and, and looking at other cars passing you by, but you can in fact charge quickly, move on. And of course, what we wanna make happen as part of that uh, quick charge is, is quick and easy payment as well. Next slide, please. I believe this is my final slide, and it just it's kind of an indication of the the multitude of of networks that exist out there, um, what the percentages are, and and if you look at the number of stations, forty eight thousand, that differs from the ninety thousand that was presented earlier, but that ninety thousand is the actual number of units, whereas this is the number of stations. Um, clearly, you know, Charge Point has the the largest um, infrastructure, and there's a number of non networked ones. And percentage of market, but then the final column is meant to indicate that what we're talking about here is already happening in some instances, whether or not it's open loop versus closed loop and open loop is, you know, can I pay with my Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Amex card, um, or do I have to download a mobile app or a fob and, and do something sort of non um, non-intuitive in terms of, of uh, what we're used to as consumers. And uh, you may notice uh, Tesla there is, is marked as an open pilot. So they have historically been closed, but they have provided indication that um, that they would like to open up their charging network to other um, to other electric vehicles and they are piloting that experience right now. So, and, and if you take this, you know, to Canada or the, the, or the European markets, you'll get an even greater number of uh, potential network providers that are um, encountering and, and trying to manage the, the exact sort of challenges and opportunities that we're here to discuss today. I think that's it for me. So Cindy, back to you. Great, thanks Oliver. Looking forward to hearing more from the upcoming presenters on how open payments can make paying simpler while being a secure way to pay. So next, I would like to introduce Carly Furman from NIAX, a global electric vehicle charging provider, who will cover reader considerations. So Carly, if you'd like to share a little bit about your company and then you and I can um, have a dialogue, a Q&A dialogue. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so actually, NIAX is a global uh, commerce enablement and payments platform. So we're actually a payment services provider and we're designed to help merchants scale their business with a focus on all unattended verticals, including um, the electric vehicle market. So, you know, kind of some, some quick facts, if you will, we have over 550 employees with a third of them or more than a third actually now being R&D focused. Um, so all of our developments um, are in house and we have over half a million active connection points in over 62 countries globally and have 30,000 plus um, operators, which are our end customers. Just want to maybe go to the next slide. Great. Thanks, Carly. So um, what does NIAX believe is the preferred type of transactions to accept, accept at an EV charging station? So as a global payment services provider, NIAX, we are a strong believer that accepting all forms of cashless payments that a driver may want to pay with. So this means we recommend that EV service providers or electric vehicle service providers choose an EV charger that's integrated with a PSP like NIAX um, that, that you know, offers acceptance of all card present transactions, including tapping and, in, and inserting an EMV chip card and accepting legacy map MagSafe cards, as well as accept all open loop mobile payments like Apple Pay and Google Pay. Additionally, accept uh, closed loop apps and cards. So, you know, those that could have direct funding and prepaid or top up. And then finally, also supports any and all additional um, alternative payment methods. 
So we want ED service providers to be able to ensure that any ED driver who stops their station can pay how they desire, as well as have the option to pay with a fallback method in the case that it's needed. Great, and, and that is all open loop, whether you're presenting your card or using a mobile payment, it would all be considered open loop. Um, yeah. So thanks. So from the payment side, what can be done to contribute to EV car adoption and acceptance beyond just early adopters? So I feel that really, you know, when we look at this, it's the ease, it's the payment options, and it's the familiarity that are important to go beyond EV car early adopters. So paying for charging should be easy and seamless. It, it needs to be a concise process that has clear instructions, especially since chargers are in an unattended environment. So choosing a PSD who offers an integrated reader with a sleek and eye-catching cut screen with multiple language selection options, as well as voice prompts, is a great way to ensure that the payment process and charging is intuitive and ultimately successful. Also, offering multiple ways to pay is very important. So for instance, if only a subscription app payment or contactless payment is an option is available and there is a payment completion issue, then the driver could find themselves in a position where they can charge their vehicle at the station. With so many variables in the equation when paying at an unattended charging station, including things like user error and insufficient funds, giving drivers several ways to pay when visiting a charging station will allow them to feel more comfortable with choosing an ease and electric vehicle for longer drives. Finally, the familiarity of the payment experience is really important. So post-COVID, more and more customers are accustomed to paying with a cashless form of payment and in an unattended environment. So seeing a payment device that they are already familiar with using on other unattended machines, like when they purchase a soda from a vending machine or pay at a self-checkout kiosk, leads to that comfortability. Additionally, having multiple cashless payment options when charging creates a similar payment experience is when they are pumping gas and is something that can help ease the uncertainty around around transitioning to an electric vehicle. Agree with you, Carly. Ease to pay with clear signage will be very key to expanding beyond early adopters. So what is the best way to integrate a payment terminal into an EV charging station? So the complexity of EV chargers, as well as the fact that they are being operated in unattended environments, requires an experienced payment company with an agile, robust, and EV-focused integration capabilities is involved. It's best to have the payment integration done at the OEM, which stands for the Original Equipment Manufacturer level. These are charger manufacturers who integrate NIAX's payment solution um, with, you know, for the EVSPs to purchase and then operate to ensure all code is implemented correctly and that SDKs and APIs are provided so that the charger and reader can communicate correctly. Additionally, successful integration between the charger and the payment de device allows the secure and successful transmission of the transaction details to, partner to partnering processors. The integration between the payment services provider and the charger can also allow for operational efficiencies, robust data exchanges, and the implementation of loyalty programs. So it's more than just choosing a payment terminal provider, but also choosing a payments technology partner who has a proven EV charger integration experience and a flexible payments platform. Great. So can you also share what payment security features should be considered? Yeah, of course. So you know, let's be honest, the payments ecosystem is complex in all environments but especially so when you're looking at an unattended environment. A payment services provider with an end-to-end -end solution created solely for unattended machines means that in addition to providing EVSPs, the payment terminal, and the related integration expertise with the charger, the, the PSP is also responsible for the ongoing payment certifications and for the secure cloud-based environment that makes up the total payment solution architecture. So for instance, with NIAC servers, we are PCI DSS level one certified, and our devices are EMV L1 and L2 certified for contact and contactless, as well as L3 end-to-end -end certified with, multi with multiple banking partners globally. This reduces both the payment liability and the compliance costs for the EV service providers. Additionally, NIAC's system architecture includes a proprietary skipping server mechanism to ensure maximum uptime. So over-the-air firmware updates and cellular modems included in the devices ensure that EVSPs do not have to worry 
about how the payment devices communicate and the security of the payments or that they will be missing out on accepting additional payment types in the future. Great, thanks Carly. Um, thanks so much for your time. And uh, so next we're going to um, Nick um, Pisarev with G&D will provide a high level overview of the ISO 15118 standard and how it works. And then Barton Seidels will, with BP will share benefits of implementing plug and charge technology challenges and information on a global cross industry association known as Charan, which is dedicated to promoting interoperability based on the combined charging system as the global standard for charging vehicles. So Nick, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Thanks, Cindy, and thanks everyone for joining this webinar today. So um, talking about EV, as many of you that have um, expressed some interest probably know of the many advantages that the EVs offer compared to the ICE cars, or as we call them, internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, so what are, why are EVs better, um, not just because of the environment, uh, but they generally have a, a lower center of gravity, they have excellent crash worthiness uh, due to removing the combustion engine, leading overall uh, to a much safer vehicle. Also performance-wise, acceleration, lower maintenance, um, continuous connectivity to the internet, and uh, having that powerful onboard computers that can now be powered by the batteries themselves um, continuously without interruption. Um, but often we overlook uh, additional advantages that the EVs have. Um, and, and those advantages are basically, we can summarize them as uh, we call the EVs computers on wheels. They're extremely powerful in terms of uh, software that's incorporated in the vehicles. Uh, they can, can communicate to the internet at all times, even when they're not being in use. And very importantly, they can communicate with the charging station when they're plugged in. And that's what we're really uh, focusing on ISO 1511-8 uh, as a capability of the vehicles. Great, Nick. So, Nick, can, uh, what happens when you plug in an electric vehicle to charge? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. So, um, unlike, again, as Oliver keeps comparing EVs to gas cars, um, when you plug in the EV uh, to the supply equipment, to the charging station, um, the uh, EV starts talking to it and it, it uh, communicates Unlike, again, the gas station, uh, gas cars, I want diesel or I want uh, gasoline. The car says, I want electricity, uh, I want it at this rate, at this current, at this voltage. So this uh, uh, is all done via the protocol uh, defined by the plugs or the connectors, uh, uh, known as uh, very often the CCS connectors that are used by many of the EV manufacturers, but also uh, in North America, Tesla uses a proprietary connector. Those connectors may be different, but the protocol that um, establishes this um, link between the EV and the charging station are more or less um, talking or uh, uh, speaking the same language. Um, so that is really the first and most important functional capabilities um, um, of communication between the uh, charging station and the vehicle. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, ISO 1511-8 is even more than that. Um, and uh, we, we jump in into um, describing in more detail. Great. So Nick, can you, will you be able to then share a little bit more around the ISO 15118 standard? Um, sure. So it is a communication standard um, that allows the EVs not only to negotiate these technical aspects of the charging experience like power, uh, electrical power, current voltage, and so on, but it actually could help us uh, do the commercial business aspect of the charging uh, experience. The standard helps the EV driver uh, and the charging station identify each other using an authentication protocol. Um, they can exchange uh, digital certificates uh, for an existing business contract, 
uh, or a subscription or a membership uh, or ownership of the car. Um, all this uh, facilitates an open digital communication standard so that any EV can talk business to any electric vehicle supply equipment or charging station. Um, of course, when we talk payment, that's really what we mean, commerce and business. We need to exchange a service uh, for funds. Uh, for this, we need to know who are the parties engaging in this business transaction. What are we buying? How are we paying? And at what rate? Um, so, in other words, ISO 1511-8 plug-in charge can also help us make a fast and secure payment transaction. Um, either being as a contract or, or being as a direct payment uh, using an open payment uh, approach. Uh, once the authentication process has been completed uh, and we have agreed on how to pay, uh, the charging can start. And, and typically that is really what um, allows us that additional flexibility uh, when we talk about EVs. Great. So, so Nick, if I understand it correctly, then once the EV owner purchases and signs up for a charging service with a provider called a mobility operator, which might be an EV automa automaker like Volkswagen, then payment details using your credit, debit card, or bank account may be exchanged, making payment processing seamless when charging. Is that is that correct? Right. Um, yeah. So that's. Uh, really a part of the ISO 1511-8 um, uh, uh, definition of the standard, the mobility operator uh, stores this information and generates a digital contract certificate, um, or we call it shortly a contract, uh, that needs to be signed by, um, uh, we call it a V2G root PKI authority that confirms the authenticity of this contract and this certificate. Um, and then uh, allowing the EV owner to authenticate themselves during the charging session. Uh, this contract certificate can be installed in the car directly by the uh, OEM uh, or over the air uh, through the internet connection, or it can be downloaded uh, via the charging station itself. Um, all digital certificates are in place um, for the plug and charge session, uh, and when they're verified, um, then the charging can begin. Um, and that really is where the security aspect of the charging um, with ISO 1511-8 uh, comes into play. Um, uh, as we speak about these methods of payment on, on, the, on the next slide, I think we can explore a bit more into depth as to what are the possible uh, payment um, paths that we can take. Um, as mentioned so far, the plug-in charge ISO 1511-8 standard uh, can uh, contain a contract uh, identifying who you are and your account. Um, and if such a contract is uh, uh, possible to validate and ensure that it is present and authentic, then the plug-in charge can begin. Often, though, that may be a challenge um, depending on how many charging networks we have and what kind of relationship the consumer may have uh, with this particular charging network. There's also possibility to do roaming contracts between charging networks, which can then um, accommodate that commerce business relationships across networks. But uh, speaking as to how much more diversity we will have in the world of EVs and charging, we're speaking of many, many different type of entities that can uh, be uh, acting as a charging uh, network operators. And you may not have a contract or there may not be a roaming contract with a network of use. So ISO 1511-8 defines a fallback uh, if no contract uh, is available for charging with this network. Um, and uh, I'll jump on to the Third uh, blue item, uh, which is really typically what happens today, if there is no contract, you can still do an open payment by using the so-called external payment mechanism where you insert or tap a, a payment card um, at the charging station. 
Uh, what is though interesting, and again, as I mentioned before, we are overlooking that significant advantage that the EVs have. They can actually talk securely to the charging station. Um, so before jumping to an external payment, which is what we traditionally use at gas pumps, ISO 1511-8 can be uh, enhanced even further, uh, very much like we use our phones today to pay for goods when we have uh, forgotten or put our wallet behind at the merchants in many different locations, we could actually use the EV uh, to deliver the payment credentials directly over the charging cable. So that doesn't exist today, but it is something that we at the Payments uh, Forum in the U.S. are proposing into the white paper we've published that uh, ISO 1511 can uh, ISO 1511 can be advanced as what we call for now a direct payment method, which is the uh, the yellow path in the middle. Uh, before jumping to the external uh, payment by tapping inserting card, you could actually enroll, as we know it, a tokenized version of your payment card into the vehicle itself. And instead of needing to tap uh, externally, the vehicle itself can deliver that payment token to the charging uh, station directly. So no tapping would be required. And again, that would be uh, a benefit uh, when we have the case uh, without a contract with that particular charging station. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah. And um, just so everybody knows that that um, white paper um, proposal is available as outlined earlier in the webinar at the Secure Technology Alliance. So you can go there and download that paper. So Nick, can you um, review some of the use cases? I'm sure. Um, so 1511 is a communication standard. Think of it as a, a language we speak, like the English language. Um, the, it doesn't really depend on the physical connectivity. It just creates the rules and the protocols, how information is exchanged. So the most common use case is the plug and charge in public uh, charging networks where you have to uh, uh, do payment, not really at home when you don't really need to pay if you charge at home, uh, but when you do use a public uh, charging station and you have to pay for, for the charging service. Um, though it could also be used in places where even at home um, uh, you can uh, jump into what we call smart charging uh, and in general V2G or vehicle to grid uh, um, environment uh, and in, in fact, it could even work in reverse uh, if we use our vehicles in an emergency or extraordinary situation even to send uh, energy back to the grid. So it's bi-directional. Uh, so that's what we call smart charging. Smart charging can also refer to the case where uh, we uh, use different rates based on the utility providers uh, that can say, uh, charging at that speed at that time uh, is more efficient and it will have a different rates of uh, uh, payment and so on and so forth. So these are all the different uh, uh, use cases. Wireless as well, uh, as I mentioned, um, the, the con connection between the vehicle and the charging station is really not relevant. Uh, 1511 is a communication standard that describes how we exchange service for payment. So it could also be used uh, with a wireless charging uh, stations. Great. Nick, you want to go on then to the next slide, please? Um, so uh, just to give a perspective about 1511.8 adoption today, um, this isn't a standard that is just on paper uh, published by the ISO organization. It has already been implemented by many uh, charging networks and also uh, ca car manufacturers. So you see a, a few logos here in uh, on this slide. 
um, just to list a few, and there's many more coming um, that will support uh, 1511.8. Um, all these uh, uh, implementation uh, from the uh, vehicle manufacturers like Volkswagen, like Lucid, Audi, uh, Porsche, Ford, um, um, uh, Rivian, and so on, are implementing the standard into their vehicle, but also the charging networks led by Electrify America and also uh, equipment suppliers uh, like ABB are all um, implementing this standard. Uh, the standard will continue to evolve, uh, likely as, as any, any standard, any other standard, uh, but it does provide the framework uh, for those entities to be able to talk to each other. I'm pretty sure that um, we would see uh, this standard becoming more and more popular in the future. Uh, even uh, Tesla, who uh, probably uh, has implemented a similar standard uh, to that uh, before even that standard was made available, is uh, hopefully likely going to adopt a similar approach or even um, enhance uh, their vehicles and charging networks to adopt the standard as well. At least we hope that is going to happen in the future. Thanks so much, Nick, for your time today. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Barton Seidels from BP. Barton, welcome. And our first question is, what are the benefits of implementing plug and charge technology? Great, well, first of all, thanks Cindy for having me on the, the webinar. So um, in terms of benefits, I think that, you know, in general, there's um, high level ones, kind of the security aspect, definitely um, ease of charging and a good EV driver charging experience. Um, and so I think with these benefits, you also have to take a look at the, the different ways in which the, the main stakeholders are involved in the process. And so as Nick was just kind of referring, you have the, like the charging network provider, which is sometimes referred to as a CPO, and the mobility operator. And then of course you have the EV car company, the um, referred to as the OEM. But you know, security is critical from an industry point of view, maybe a little bit less so from the consumer because they kind of assume that. But as many of the, the web attendees here today know, I mean, a, a secure transaction is critical to give comfort to all of the market players and of course the, the regulators and also security from uh, a standpoint of kind of the access of the, the hardware, the, the chargers and the vehicle. And then of course, kind of further up the, the value chain on the energy resources and the utilities. But, um, and with the kind of the ease of charging, this is really achieved by eliminating all the, the, the different fobs that people might know about that have EVs. You have to have a be subscriber to the different networks and you often have to have either a fob or a card um, and the simplicity of plug and charge is really that the driver is able to just plug it in and the charging begins. And the idea is kind of make it easier than pumping gas. And so when you look at it from a the charging network point of view from the um, CPO perspective, the you know one of the main uh, benefits is really offering the best EV driver charging experience, which should increase the utilization of the charger, the charging network, which is of course you know good from a business point of view for them, but it's also a win for the for the driver. Um, and so, you know, of course, the, 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 the charging network benefits from the security aspect because of securing their their charger of not having maybe that be compromised. And then I guess that, you know, just one last point Cindy, on this is that, you know, with the OEMs, they like to, you know, they want to have as good of a, a charging experience because the, the easier and the, let's say, I don't want to say fun, but the, the um, better the experience is, then they're going to sell more vehicles. At the end of the day, that's what they want, but they now have an opportunity to be more engaged with the, the driver to provide that good experience. So, and, and of course, you know, again, the security, because of the uh, vehicles these days are, you know, highly technical, very, lots of chips. You hear about all the delays of the EVs coming out because uh, or, and even ICE vehicles, but a lot of the EVs because they have a chip shortage. So it's just a huge technical, it's a big kind of computer on wheels. So that security aspect is important for them too. Yes, um, very similar to what Nick had said earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, so what are your thoughts on market acceptance and what's driving the momentum for plug and charge adoption? Uh, 
Well, in terms of, I think that for plug and charge adoption, it, you know, the, the end driver, I mean, they, they just, they can only do it if the car's there. So I think that really kind of the, the main market acceptance from the, the key stakeholders has really been, I, I guess you could um, kind of break it down into two areas. One is just the availability um, and, um, and compatibility of the EVs that are plug and charge enabled. And and kind of also then the the standard um, in terms of you know the companies relying on something that they feel that they can implement that is kind of consistent and is going to be um, there in the future. Um, and so with all the new technologies, there are early adopters that will kind of uh, move in quick, early, and um, embrace it. But then there's also a lot of them are kind of wait and see. But I think there's a lot more. Momentum that is happening in the market, as you saw from um, Nick's uh, last slide there, you know, there's a lot of global companies that are working on or have implemented plug and charge. Uh, you know, the, you've got some of the, the OEMs and some of the other networks, you know, Electrify America here, Ionity over in Europe, and actually my company BP, um, we just actually, we, we launched and we uh, enabled plug and charge on all of our DC fast chargers across our network in Germany. Um, and we're working to enable that with other um, markets. Uh, but EV OEMs, you know, they, they're looking for that differentiation. Um, and the EVs that have, you know, looking to offer that great uh, experience, that charging experience possible, you, you've seen, uh, you know, again, as we saw some of those like Lucid and Porsche, uh, Ford, VW, a few that are implementing the plug and charge. And I think that is, you know, more OEMs implement this, then definitely you're going to have the charging networks to follow because otherwise, why would a charging network um, invest that money um, on not only kind of the, it's not, I mean, it is a bit of hardware, but it's mainly software and all that, that integration. So, um, and I think that also we have kind of on regulation. So it's not only the, the standards, but then you have um, some of the, on the, on a state level that are, um, acknowledging this and pushing this. So here in California, the CEC, the California energy commission that is supporting a big supporter of the interoperability and technologies like plug and charge. So that helps in a transition towards the kind of zero emission, um, type of future proofing of the standards. So more companies that implement, especially around an interoperable and open standard. And more companies will start to implement and make that investment. And so, and just on, kind of, I guess, one last thing is that, you know, as a more, you know, common picture as there's more companies that are coming together uh, to adopt plug and charge and, and working on a standard to um, that everybody's kind of able to have a common point of reference. You had mentioned earlier Charin as a good example of a global association, which is uh, been created uh, to support interoperability and um, ISO 15, 1511A does kind of the commission, excuse me, communication standard that is enabling these different use cases of plug and charge and smart charging, as Nick pointed out. So they've been very supportive. And I think that that's a really good grounding point for companies to go back to um, and know that there's kind of this common voice of um, like minded stakeholders coming together. Yeah, great. And uh, yeah, Visa actually recently announced joining Charlin. So um, was a lot of good work there. Uh, so what do you see the main challenges faced with when implementing plug and charge? Uh, well, um, I, I guess, it, you know, kind of with, as you can imagine with any emerging technology, you have kind of uh, inherent challenges along the way, right? So um, I guess for 1511A plug and charge, you know, the, the standard is, you know, this is, you're dealing with a lot of complexity. You're dealing, this is a communication protocol between a very complex uh, technology, which is the EV, and then also with the charging station. And on top of that, you have all these other standards. So I think that, you know, there's a, a, a very big um, uh, kind of, leap that we are having to to go through and, and understanding but i think that so the standard is a bit complex but it's and it's taking time to develop the the standardization of the document but i think as we're progressing along that um and more com more companies and stakeholders uh invest into this that we start to see more of a coherent and path forward um, but as you mentioned before kind of the standardization of um, some of the key uh, the standardization is key for these companies to commit their investment, especially on the OEM and then on the, the charging 
uh, network and the hardware side. Um, and so relying on documentation that is agreed upon is really, I think, a, a, a beginning point. Um, I, and I think that the kind of there's been a challenge of the kind of the perception that some of the OEMs that are working on this, um, but there's also a lot that uh, I think that other people don't know about. So I think there's going to be a big wave. Um, Oliver was talking about all this investment that's going into the OEMs on the EV side, and I think that they're seeing that you know a great charging experience is super important. So I think that they're starting to embrace this, and there's a lot more investments that's, that's coming into it. So. But I mean, I think other challenges that, you know, comes down to a bit of economics, you know, kind of the dollars and cents that every stakeholder is conscious about the, um, the investment commitment needed for wider adoption. Um, and, you know, this will, this will be driven. I've you know mentioned several times before, but a lot on the OEM side, if there's no vehicle out there, then there's less of an incentive for some of the charging networks and hardware providers to invest in this area as well. But I think that because of. Uh, the, the move and in interest for um, the legacy OEMs in addition to the new um, EV OEMs focusing on this. That's very key. The like um, California CEC want to have plug and charge enabled in hardware, I think is very key. And, um, and also, you know, just the fact that CARB has mandated that chargers have to have credit card readers here in California. I mean, that's also really an important part of this whole discussion. So I, you know, and also the um, the proposed to have more payment options as you know in California, maybe in other states as well. But I think that that's you know once they see that the technology is working um, seamlessly, I think that there might be kind of less need for that. But you know, it's it's options. So, but I think that as you know, as people have more questions around the security and and payment and testing, there's you know, webinars like this are really important for people to get information and and mentioned. Um, Charin, um, so Charin is working on addressing these concerns as well. There's other projects that SAE is working on, um, but Charin is also, they're trying to enable this by having testing uh, events uh, that are enable the OEMs and the hardware manufacturers to come together. Um, so anyway, I think Charin is a good place to kind of get additional information on. So hopefully that answers your question. Great, and thanks so much, Barton, for being able to present today. So um, we have three minutes left. Uh, we're going to um, Gabriella Loazes from Discover, and I are going to cover some quick updates on um, mm -hmm. global payment network considerations. So uh, what I wanted to call out is that one of the requirements is that um, using the right merchant category code, also known as MCC, is really important. And there is one designated for electric vehicle charging, which is um, which all the global make payment networks support. Mm -hmm. And that value is 5552. Uh, similar to petroleum, there can be multiple uses at a location for the MCC. So uh, the appropriate MCC should be used based on the merchant's primary business. So in some cases today, we're uh, seeing EV charging stations are not integrated with indoor. Therefore, you could see three different MCCs, one for EV charging, one for indoor, and one for actually um, pumping gas. There are benefits when using the appropriate MCC. It helps to differentiate EV charging transactions from other transactions, like parking fees for data reporting, as well as issuance reward programs and analytics. So merchants should always use the designated MCC for their primary business. So next, Gabriella um, will cover a few, con and I will cover a few considerations on EVC transactions. So Gabriella, for Discover, how should an EVC transaction be processed? Um, you know, very important point, Cindy, like you mentioned, is using the right MCC, because that also gives merchants coverage for, uh, you know, against chargebacks. Um, you know, in terms of models for processing, Discover is still evaluating, but we kind of follow the same um, lead at the other um, networks. Great. And then um, just from an authorization perspective, you can either authorize for a known amount or at the end of the transaction or authorize using an estimated amount. And Visa actually recommends using the estimated amount. It limits the impacts of holds and reduces the need for additional authorizations. 
And for EV, time between pre-op and completion may be longer than with fuel. So the estimated EVC transaction amount should be much lower than traditional fuel and should reverse any difference as soon as possible and no later than the end of the day for Visa. So Gabriella, is that similar for Discover? Um, yes, in the uh, authorization specs also state that reversals must occur prior to the submission of sales data relating to the original authorization message or financial transaction message. Since most merchants submit sales data daily, this will be in line with what was described uh, by you for Visa. Thank you so much. And we are right at time. So all I wanted to share was that uh, you, it's really important that you should be familiar with processing EVC authorizations and you should refer to each payment network specific requirements. And for Visa information is available on the Visa Technology Partner website or visa.com. And Gabriella, where can you find information for Discover? Yes, for Discover, please refer to instructions in your authorization interface and sales data interface for processing a submission of incremental authorizations. You can always call um, your Discover representative as well for any specific questions about EV charging processing. Excellent. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Devin. Yep, is that Cindy? I'm on. Hopefully you guys Jason? Okay, now. great. Thank yep, you. I am here. Yep, apologize for the uh, technical difficulties earlier. Just when you think you've seen it all, something else pops up. But thank you to Devin for jumping in. Thank you again to all the panelists. A ton of great content here. Thank you, Cindy, for driving the conversation. I know that there were some questions relative to availability of this deck. Is it will be posted on the U.S. Payments Forum website, which again is uspaymentsforum.org. So if you have questions relative to the content and or want to reach out to one of the, the panelists specifically, you can see that our website, our email addresses are on there. So feel free to, to reach out. Thank you again. This is a topic that is near and dear to the, the, the forum as we move forward. We will be forming a dedicated working group relative to EV charging here moving forward. So um, more discussions to come. But thank you for attending and we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Thank you.